In Psalm 46, the Bible says that God is our refuge and strength. God is an ever-present help in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. That's why we're here this morning, to worship our God. Our God who indeed is our refuge. Our God who is our strength. Is God your refuge this morning? Okay, I believe that. Is God your strength? I believe that too. So good to see you this morning. Uh, I, I like changing stuff once in a while. <laughs> Even though we've been kind of forced into uh, uh, our changes this morning, uh, it's fresh. And uh, I'm, I'm okay with that. Are you okay with that? Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much for being here. We, uh, we're not sure how long uh, we're going to be allowed to meet. Now, my thought is, uh, and I'm anticipating Governor Inslee uh, getting on the television. Seems like he likes to get on TV and uh, make proclamations, you know, show he's the governor, you know. Uh, I anticipate he'll probably say, well, we can't have any meetings with more than 10 folk. And you know what I'm thinking? Let's have meetings with 10 folk. <laughs> we'll have 10 in here and 10 in there and 10 downstairs. But anyway, we, uh, you know, uh, Lynn, uh, Paul and I, and uh, I really appreciate so much uh, our elders. You know, we, we work together. You know, we're, we're just like that. We're, we're working together, we're unified. And uh, we love you and, and we want to do the best for you. And so, uh, uh, so whatever happens, then we'll, we'll talk about some options. And so I'm so glad that you, uh, you chose to be here. I told Lynn this morning, uh, I said, I go to the grocery store and it's more risky in terms of the coronavirus for me to go to the grocery store because I get a cart and nobody wiped the cart off. Uh, I'm touching groceries and nobody wiped those groceries off. Uh, when I get to check out, I punch in that thing. Hundreds of people have been touching that thing. It's safer here. I don't know who's coughing in the grocery store and who I'm rubbing up against. So uh, anyway, that's what's going through my mind. So I'm so glad that, uh, that you're here this morning. What I want to do uh, today is to um, uh, pause the current series that we've been on um, for I don't know how long now in terms of knowing what you believe, even though the, the concept of believing still will, will apply to what I want to talk about, uh, both today and then um, we're, we're working on streaming our services, and so we're going to hopefully next week be able to have that uh, capacity to do that. Uh, and so if you're not here, you'll be able to watch our services online. Uh, and so uh, our plan then is to continue uh, uh, in terms of this series. And uh, uh, what I want to do is I want to talk about um, this new series. Of course, here's our new schedule, I think, as you, all of you know today. Uh, so at 10.15, we'll have our Bible classes, and then we'll have another worship at 11.15. No 5 p.m. service today, by the way. No 5 p.m. service. But I want to talk about um, learning to face our fears. Learning to face our fears. Uh, this is a timely message uh, because the coronavirus has created a lot of fear. And it's a reminder of one of the things that we all share. And that is we, we get scared of stuff. That part of the human condition and our human experience is fear. Now, I don't need to, to have you raise your hands uh, if I was to ask uh, how many of you fear something, every single hand would go up. I know that. I don't even need to, need to ask you. But fear is something that we all have in common. Even, even as children, uh, we don't learn fear. It seems that fear is a part of our nature. And of course, when it comes to fear, um, there, there's a lot of common fears. You may think about, and I want you to think about the fears that you experience. Some people, for example, are, are afraid of heights. You know, uh, talk to somebody and say, hey, look, uh, let's go to the Space Needle. No, I don't want to go up there. Well, it's been standing since 1962. It's not going to fall, but there's a fear. Some people are, are afraid of flying, flying, getting in an airplane, even though 
technically and statistically, it's, it's safer to fly in an airplane than it is to drive an automobile. Some people are, are, are afraid of, of open spaces. They get this anxiety being in open space. Some, just the opposite, fear closed in spaces. Several months ago, I had to have a, an MRI done on my shoulder. I injured my shoulder last year. still bothered me a year later. And uh, uh, how many of you have ever had an MRI? Okay, a few of you. That's the big donut. And, and uh, that procedure took about, it took at least about 30 minutes or longer. It took about 45 minutes, 30, 45 minutes. And, and about, the, about the 40 minute point, when I'm just squeezed in that thing, I, I just start feeling something I hadn't, I hadn't felt before. It was called anxiety. And uh, each time the, the, the tech would take a picture, okay, this is, this is going to last, you know, uh, 45 seconds. This is going to last a minute. And so about at the 40 minute mark, I said, now how long is this going to last and when is the last one? <laughs> I, I was just feeling anxious being in this closed in space. A lot of people are scared of, of snakes, scared of dogs. Scared of storms, scared of needles, a lot of fear. Now, when it comes to this uh, circumstance that we're in with this uh, uh, coronavirus, uh, in, in one sense, this is, this, it, it, this is an amazing picture. And in, in one sense, uh, if, if we didn't connect it with what this thing does, We'd say, wow, that, that's, that's beautiful. Look at that. And uh, I was a biology major as an undergrad, and so I'm, I'm into this kind of stuff. You know? <laughs> what does this virus do it? But now the association with this virus and, and illness, when we see even, even the picture of the coronavirus, it, it, it causes fear. Some of you may have seen this picture. This is Mike uh, Colvin, I think his name is. He's from uh, a town outside of Chattanooga, Tennessee. And he purchased, he and his brother purchased almost 18,000 bottles of hand sanitizer. 18,000. And what he did was, was he, he put it on Amazon and jack the price up. Way up. Something you'd pay a dollar for, he wants to charge seven dollars for it. And what happened was Amazon caught on to him because you're not supposed to take advantage of people like that. And matter of fact, the Attorney General of Tennessee is on him for that same reason. Well, why did he think he could do that? Well, well, because people were scared. Oh, I don't have hand sanitizer. The virus is going to get me. Now, you should know, soap works better. <laughs> okay. I'm trying to figure out how to take some soap and water in my car. Okay. But it was because of fear. Okay, here's another, here's another scene that maybe you've seen. Seen that? You see the, the empty shelves at the store? People saying, we're going to run out of toilet paper. <laughs> God forbid we'd run out of toilet paper. The world's going to end. We're going to run out of toilet paper. People scared. They're scared. By the way, before the, the scare and the rush on toilet paper hit, I had been to Costco two weeks before, so I kind of beat that one. <laughs> but we, we fear things, don't we? We fear things. Now, when it comes to, to life circumstances... There's a lot of fear that we experience. We experience fear when it comes to our finances. There's a lot of fear. Now, not only is, is this virus impacting health, it's impacting everything. Am I going to have a job? Where's my money going to come from? Am I going to be able to pay my bills? It's fear. And of course, when it comes to our, our health, that's really what this is about. It's, it's the fear of health and the lack of health. 
We have fear when it comes to our, our children. We want to know, are, are our children going to be all right? When uh, time comes for your new child to go to school. Oh, that's, that's a tough day for parents. Because they're leaving the house. We're not going to see them all day. Are they going to be all right? We fear for our, for our kids. We fear when it comes to relationships. For individuals who, who maybe are, are, are seeking a lifetime partner. Uh, they're, 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 they're thinking, am I ever going to find somebody? Is the Lord going to send me somebody? And then once, once they get together, uh, they're, they're fearing, is it going to last? Did you know one of the things that children fear uh, when they're growing up? They're fearing and they're wondering if their parents are going to stay together. Because most of the other kids in their class, their parents aren't together. And so they're, they're, they're kids. So, so one of the best things that you can do for your child is stay together and love each other. It's fear. And then when it comes to, to our spiritual lives, uh, we've been talking about the subject of, of justification. And, and we wonder, you know, how does God feel about me? Does he accept me? Is he still in my life? Even though I've done all these things, you know, I, I haven't been the person that I've been called to be. How does, how does that affect my relationship with God? And so, so, so we have a lot of fear. And then, uh, you know, we wonder, you know, the, the, the biggest fear, and I'll talk about that uh, maybe next week, uh, is the fear of death. But you know, there's one fear stronger than the fear of death for Christians. That's dying and going to hell. We would talk about that. So there's all kind of fears that we experience in our everyday lives. Well, let's, let's think about fear. What, what is fear? This is what I call the triangle of fear. The triangle of fear. Three elements. The triangle of fear. Fear involves what we're thinking. It involves uh, how I'm feeling. And it involves what I'm doing. So my thoughts... My feelings and my actions. Now, one of the ways of illustrating this is to think about an experience of fear that's described in Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, there's a familiar story of, of Adam and uh, Eve, and they're in the garden. And of course, uh, God had created the universe, created them, put them in a, a, a this nice garden, and he, he gave Adam some instructions about what he could eat, what he could not eat. And then, of course, in Genesis chapter 3, the serpent appears on the scene. He's described as being crafty. And he comes to the woman and he gets her to doubt. And he says, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman responded, yeah, we, we could eat of any tree, but... He said, you must not eat of the fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden. He said, you must not touch it or you will die. The serpent said, nah, that ain't right. Nah, that's not right. You're not going to die. Matter of fact, God's trying to keep something from you. See, whenever we, whenever we fail to realize that God always wants our best, we tend to stray. The serpent said, nah, you, you won't die. As a matter of fact, if you do this, it's going to benefit you. Because God knows that when you eat it from your eyes, you will be open, you will be like God, you will know good from evil. So the woman thought, said, oh, that, that's, that sounds pretty good. And so what did she do? She took it. She ate some of it. And it was so good, what'd she do? She gave some to her husband. Yeah, I kind of wonder, where was Adam right there? <laughs> was he kind of on the side, you know, kind of hearing all this, listening? Matter of fact, when you look at the curses that God gave, God, God condemned Adam because he said, you listened to your wife at the wrong time. 
Now that's not an absolute statement, brothers. <laughs> Most of the time we need to listen to our wives, but not when she's wrong. The Bible says, verse 7, both of their eyes were open, they realized they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Verse 8, I love this picture. The Bible says, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. See, God is not shaken by what we do. See, we get, we get shook up when, when other people do, our wives do things, our husbands, our children. We get shook. God, God, God is not shaken by anything that we do. So God was just strolling through the garden, you know, maybe whistling, you know, enjoying the breeze and the, the warmth of the sun. The Bible says that they hid from God, from the Lord God, among the trees of the garden. And God called out to him. I love that. See, when we stray away, you know what God does? He comes after us. He knows exactly where we are. It says that they hid. And he called out. He said, where are you? And notice he, it says he called to the man. Where are you? And Adam answered, I heard you in the garden, and here it is, I was afraid. I was afraid. Well, what, what thoughts go through our mind when we're afraid? Well, uh, we think we're in danger. We think that possibly some kind of harm is going to come to us, that, that we, we anticipate uh, that there's some kind of pain that's pending. We anticipate and, uh, and experience fear because we're thinking a certain way. Adam was thinking something. And he probably was thinking that God was going to harm him in some manner. And you know something? What's interesting about, about the thought part of fear is that the, the, what we're thinking about could be real or it could be imagined. Doesn't matter. Even imaginary thoughts can cause fear. You're watching a movie. It's a vampire movie. Now, you know there's no such things as vampires, right? You do know that, right? <laughs> okay. You, 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 you know in your, in your brain and your intellect there's no such thing as a vampire. But what happens? It comes on the screen and you get scared. Oh, here he comes. His teeth are out. He's got blood on his mouth. He's coming after whoever's in the movie. And, and you identify. That's what movies are about. You, you identify with the people in the movies. And you think he's coming after you. So fear involves our thoughts, what we're thinking. But fear also involves our feelings. What, what does fear feel like? What does it feel like? Well, it's uneasy. You feel distressed. Uh, you feel anxious. You feel worried. You feel nervous. It's all because of what's gone through your thoughts. Your body reacts. And that's part of the action. And there's, there's, there's actions that happen without your choosing those actions. So for example, your, your heart speeds up right away. Automat you didn't say, okay, heart speed up. But your brain triggered something that said, I'm in trouble. I'm in danger. There's some pain coming. And so it, it speeds up. It pounds and, and, and you start to sweat. Oh, I guess I learned women, women don't sweat. They perspire. And so you, you start to perspire and, and you shake and your, your breathing is, is shortened. And what did, what did Adam do? He hid. That was an action. He hid. He was scared. So he hid. And when we're afraid, we may run. 
We may choose to avoid certain things. We may fight. We may even say something. And then you know what else? We may even just freeze. We stop. Ever had, ever had one of those dreams? Somebody's chasing you in that dream. And, and, and you freeze. You freeze. And, and you're so thankful when, you know, you wake up. It's like, wow, okay. I can move now. Get away from that thing that's chasing me. It's the triangle of fear. It's thoughts. It's feelings. It's actions or behaviors. Now, here's what the Bible says. The Bible says, do not fear. Have you ever read that? Do not fear. Do not be afraid. And I, I did a little survey and... and uh, most of the time, I trust other people to count those large numbers that come in Scripture. But I, I counted this one myself. I went through the International Version of the Bible, and uh, I found that over 100 times, over 100 times, both in the Old Testament and New Testament, we find the expression, do not be afraid or do not fear. Over 100 times. Now, if the Bible says something one time in Scripture, we ought to pay attention to it. But 100 times? 100 times? God says, don't be afraid, don't fear. Well, that must be pretty important. And I think, I think God says it over and over and over again so that hopefully we can get it. In education, it's called spaced repetition. And that's how we learn. That's how kids learn. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. How, how do you learn these random sounds? You repeat it. And so over a hundred times, God is repeating this same message. Do not be afraid. Do not fear. Now here's the question. How can we learn to do that? Well, that's what this series is about. How, how can we learn to practice what God has said. Now, let me draw this to a conclusion and, and, uh, and send you away with something to think about. I want us to look at this one verse. It's found in Genesis 26. And it's verse 24. This is one of those over 100 times in which God says these words. And here's what he says in this context. He says... I am the God of your father, Abraham. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. Now let me, let me give you the, the background behind what's going on here. What's happening is, is, this is a message that's given to Isaac. Now if you remember, back in Genesis chapter 12... God made a promise to Abram. In Genesis 12, God said to Abram, go from your country, your people, your father's house to a land and I'll show you. And the promise was, I'll make you a great nation. I'll bless you. Make your name great. So the Bible says, Abram went as the Lord had told him. Now, God told Abram that, that he would be the father of, of a great nation. The problem was Abram didn't have any kids. And at that time in Genesis chapter 12, Abram is 75 years old. You're thinking now, no wonder he didn't have any kids, right? But with God, anything is possible. 75 years. Now, Abram 
even tries, because years pass and he has no kids, he even tries to help God. God, I know you said this, but, but it's not happening yet, so let me see if I can help you out here. So he has a child by Sarai's handmaiden, Hagar, the son was Ishmael. But this is not the son that God had promised. And so 25 years later from Genesis chapter 12, when God makes this promise to Abram, 25 years later, in Genesis 17, God says to him, Genesis 17, 19, he says, your wife Sarah will bear you a son and you will call him Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. Here, what God was doing, God was confirming to Isaac the covenant and the promise that was made to his father. So in Genesis 26, Isaac's mother, Sarah, is dead. Isaac's father, Abraham, is dead. And so Isaac is now in Bathsheba. And one night, the Lord speaks to him. And this is what he says. I am the God of your father, Abraham. Do not be afraid, for I'm with you. I will bless you. I will increase the number of your descendants for the sake of my servant, Abraham. The Bible says in verse 25 that Isaac built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord. Now God says to Isaac two things. What are those two things? Do not be afraid, for I am with you. There are two elements here I want to suggest. First of all, there is a command a command, an instruction. God says to Isaac, do not be afraid. What is that? That's a command. And secondly, there is a promise. A promise. The promise is, I'm with you. I'm with you. I will be with you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'm always there. So here's the question. When we are in the face of fear, how do we live out God's instruction? Well, there's two things. We follow the command. We follow the command. We follow the command and we claim the promise. We'll continue this next time. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you for its truth. We thank you as to how it reveals to us who you are and what your will is for us. We do recognize, Father, that we, uh, we, we fear, we're fearful of many things. But help us today to recognize that you're with us. And because of that, we have no reason to fear. We pray this through the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Uh, this morning, I think most of us are Christians, but if you're not a Christian today, we invite you uh, to respond to the Lord's invitation to the gospel the good news of Jesus' death and resurrection. The response is one of faith, repentance, confession, and baptism in water for the forgiveness of sins. We're also here. We will take a few moments to pray for you if you have a, a need for prayer. And so we have a song uh, that's selected. Let's, let's stand and sing that song. If you have a need, you come right now.